Math 31, we're back and we're going to find the same information we did in example three. We want a lead term, a degree, and an end behavior. But I gave you the function in a slightly different form. So you see, I gave you this function in factored form, whereas in example three, everything was multiplied out and you could see the four terms of your polynomial. And I don't know that this will have four terms, we'll find out. But given the function f of x equaling 0.2, times x minus 2, times x plus 1, times x minus 5, express the function as a polynomial in general form and determine the leading term, the degree, and the end behavior of the function. Now when I say general form, I mean we got to multiply all this out, which is going to suck for a little bit, but we can do it. So we're going to multiply this out, and I just want to kind of talk about what I already know to be the lead term, and here's what I mean. If you were to take the lead term in each of these factors, x is the lead term here because x has a higher degree than two. This is degree one, this is degree zero. x is the lead term here, and x is the lead term here. So eventually when I multiply these, I'm gonna have 0.2 times x times x times x. And, and we'll see that play out, but I just want you to, you can kind of see it ahead of time. The lead term is 0.2 times x times x times x. So I'm actually just gonna put this as a little placeholder. I believe the lead term will be 0.2 times x cubed. So you can actually guess your leading term just by looking at the lead terms of each of your factors and multiplying those together and then multiplying it by that coefficient. Now I, I wrote this in pencil kind of lightly. In case I'm wrong, I can erase it. But let's just take a look at this. So I'm gonna put a little squiggles here to separate and let's start foiling. Or really, I'm going to double distribute in a bit. Okay, so here we go. I think I am going to multiply these two terms together and these two terms together. So if I multiply, if I distribute the 0.2 to the x and the 2, I'll have 0.2x. 2 times 0.2 is minus 0.4. All right, let me multiply. And again, I'm going to do these two and these two. You can go in any order if you want to multiply these out. Uh, I just am going two at a time. Um, so we've got x squared, what, outer minus five, inner plus one, so we've got minus four x minus five here. Now I have a binomial getting multiplied to a trinomial, and I'm gonna distribute. So I need to have the 0.2x get multiplied to the x squared, four x and five, and then I need the 0.4 multiplied to the x squared, four x and five. So let me write that out. I'm gonna distribute 0.2x to my trinomial and then I'm gonna distribute 0.4 to my same trinomial. All right, so here, let me get going. We have 0.2x cubed. All right, 0.2 times negative four would be negative 0.8. Um, 0.2 times negative five would be negative one, so this will just be negative x. Um, minus 0.4x squared. Um, plus, let's see, 4 times 0.4 would be 1.6. And if, if I could, I mean, I would recommend just pausing it and multiplying it out, see if you get to my answer. Um, negative 0.4 times negative 5, that would be 2, so that would be plus 2. All right, let's see how many like terms we have. Here's an x cubed. No other x cubes, okay. Let's see, I see a squared. I don't see any x squares, but I should have gotten one. I should have a pair. Oh, I see my problem. Do you see 0.2x times four? This should have been x squared here. I just know that I should have two of them when I multiply this out. So negative 0.8 minus 0.4 is negative 1.2x squared. I should also have two linear terms. Okay, so let's see, here's a linear. Here's a linear. So we have negative one plus 1.6, so negative one plus 1.6 is positive 0.6x, and then I should just have the one constant. There we go, plus two. All right, and sure enough, I'm hoping you get the same answer I do, but sure enough, there's my lead coefficient of 0.2x cubed. So let me rewrite this a little bit darker, just because I'm sure about it now. 0.2x cubed. And we have our general form, so let me write this. We just got that our general form was 0.2x cubed minus 1.2x squared plus 0.6x 
plus two, that makes this a degree three polynomial, right? This is my leading term right here. And when it comes to answering this question of end behavior, the leading term of your polynomial, which I happen to have four terms again, but the leading, I'm sorry, the leading term of this polynomial is going to have the same end behavior as the uh, end behavior of this leading term. I don't know that I said that out loud right. So the, I should say the end behavior of my polynomial will have the same end behavior as the leading term. I think that's the sentence I wanted to say. So let me think about x cubed. If I was just gonna air draw x cubed real quick, it would look something like this. So when I talk about end behavior, let's go left and right. And let's think about what my y values are doing. Where are they headed? All right, so it looks like if I'm headed left, my arrow is down, so this is gonna go negative infinity. And if I go right, my arrow is up, so I'm gonna go positive infinity. All right, so if I wanted to write these up as arrows, let me give myself a bit more space here. I could have said left end down, right end up, or I should have said I could write these arrows, or you could write it in words. Left end down, right end up. All right. So there we go. We've got our polynomial that we've graphed, right? Polynomial was a bunch of power functions added together. We had our lead term, and that leading term was the driving factor, or not so much factor, I don't wanna say factor because that could get confused here, but the drive, the, the big drive behind what the end behavior was gonna be. And we had a degree three polynomial with the left end down and the right end up. All right, so I wanna continue working with this polynomial but I want us to take a look at a different set of traits. So we're gonna move a little bit beyond end behavior and um, lead terms and degrees, and I wanna look at intercepts and turning points of polynomial functions. All right, so a turning point of a graph is a point at which the graph changes direction from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. And these happen at maximum or minimum points. All right, so turning points are maxes or mins. All right, the y-intercept, we've talked about y-intercepts a bunch of times. The y-intercept is the point at which the function has an input value of zero, right, when x is zero. The x-intercepts are points at which the output value is zero. Y is zero. So we've talked about intercepts plenty of times before. They're gonna come up in polynomials as well. And here's, here's the, the newer piece here, all right? So a polynomial of degree n will have at most n x-intercepts and at most n minus one turning points. All right, so I wanna read this sentence again. A polynomial will have at most n x-intercepts and n minus one turning points. So if you have a degree four polynomial, you might have four x-intercepts and three turning points. If you have a seventh degree polynomial, you might have seven x-intercepts and six turning points. All right, so let's play that out for this function. So I'm gonna scooch this up a little bit more and we're gonna take a look at what we can, what can we say about this function? Same function that we were working with before. So determine the x and y intercepts for this function. How many turning points does the function have? All right, so let's go with the intercepts first. Those are the easier ones to find, and, and usually the y-intercept is the easier of the intercepts to find. So let's find a y-intercept, right? We always find a y-intercept when we let x equal zero. So that would tell us I wanna find f of zero, and f of zero would be 0 0.2 times zero minus two times zero plus one times zero minus five. All right, so let's see what we're getting here. Um, zero, this would be 0 0.2 times negative two times one times negative five. So I, I actually could do this in my head if you wanted to. Um, negative two times negative five is positive 10. Positive 10 times one is positive 10. So these three multiplied together are just the number 10. When you multiply 10 times 0.2, you just move the decimal one to the right, so you're gonna get two. So this means that my y-intercept here is the ordered pair is zero comma two. All right, so I've got my y-intercept down. That's one of them. 
Okay, now to find an x-intercept, we're going to let y equal 0. Or in this case, when we say y is equal to 0, we're actually going to let our function 0 out. So that would tell me that my function as a whole was equal to 0. All right, and let me scooch this up just a bit so that we have some room. All right, now, the nice thing about this function is it was given in factored form, right? Not general form. We found the general form up top, but it's actually nicer in factored form when it comes to finding x-intercepts because now I can use the zero product property. So this time if four quantities or four terms are multiplying to zero, then at least one of them was zero. Now, 0.2 is never equal to zero but x minus two might be equal to zero. If x were equal to two, that would be a possibility. x plus one could be equal to zero if x was negative one, and x minus five might be equal to zero if x was five. Now I've mentioned this before, but whenever you give me intercepts, they need to be ordered pairs, all right? Because they are points on the graph. So my x-intercepts are two zero, negative one zero, and five zero, all right? So I wound up having three x-intercepts, which is fine. You're, you're allowed to have three. And let's talk about this. When I wrote this function out, right, we said in general form this was 0.2x cubed minus 1.2x squared plus 0.6x plus 2, right? That's what our function was equal to in general form. And there's advantages to general form and there's advantages to the factored form. Um, general form, I can see the lead coefficient and I can see the y-intercept, right? We knew the y-intercept was zero too. You could have read it from the general form even quicker, all right? I like factored form because it really helps me find the x-intercepts. So both of these forms have their advantages, but what I want to focus on right now is we set up top that this polynomial was degree three, okay? So a polynomial of degree three will have at most three x-intercepts and two turning points. And we actually found three x-intercepts, so that's in line with this sentence. When I say at most, it means three or fewer, right? So I have at most three, and potentially when you graph a cubic, you, you usually have three x-intercepts, but you could have two, you could have one, you could have zero. Well, actually, you couldn't have zero, but, but that's beside the point. But you have at most three. All right, and two turning points. So when I start to answer this question, how many turning points does the function have? This function will have two turning points, or I should say at most two turning points. So this function will have at most two turning points, which is like trying to say it'll have two extreme points, two maxes or mins, and it'll typically be one maximum and one minimum. And let's check this on our graphing calculator. So I'm going to get my graphing calculator fired up. Now you can enter, oops, if I hit my y equals, you see I've got some stats in there. I'm going to clear this out. I'm going to turn the plot off. All right, and let's go enter the function. You could enter the function in factored form or general form. I'm gonna do factored form because that's what was given to me. And in case I made some kind of typo multiplying it out, I'd like to catch myself. Okay, I'm gonna hit zoom six, especially since I saw that stat plot on when I turned my calculator on, my window's probably all messed up. So let me reset it, zoom six. And let's see what we have. So I see my x-intercept at negative two. I see one at, um, actually not negative two, excuse me, that looks like negative one if I count it. This is positive two, three, four, five, and positive five, that lines up. And I do see my two turning points, right? I can see my maximum here and my minimum here. And keep in mind, you could use your graphing calculator to find all of these, right? I could find my zeros if I hit option two and I use blinky for a little bit, right? I go on the left, hit enter. On the right, hit enter. Enter through guess. There it is, negative one, zero. I could find my next zero. If I blink it out a little, enter, go to the right, enter, enter through guess. There's my next zero at two, zero. 
right? And I could find it for five, zero, but I, I wanna look at the max right now. So let me do second trace. Let me hit option four. All right, my max looks like it's pretty close to x equaling zero. So I'm gonna go on the left at negative one. I'm gonna go on the right at positive one and I'm gonna hit enter through guess. And actually, yeah, my max looks like it was at 0.268 and then 2.078. I could also find my min if I hit second and trace and I go to option three. Now taking a look at my min, it's here. That looks like it's at about one, two, three, four. It looks somewhere around four. So let me just go between two and five. I'm gonna go between my zeros. So two, enter, five, enter enter through guess, and it looks like my minimum was at 3.732 and then negative 2.078. So keep in mind, all of these traits that we're about to find, you can check them and find those numerical answers on your calculator. I'm still gonna wanna see the algebra work, but it's nice to know you can check yourself. All right, so let me just write a reminder here, right? So we can check this on our graphing calculators. All right, so with that, we're gonna to flip to the next example where I'm gonna give you a pretty ugly function. It's gonna be a good time, and we're really gonna try and unpack this sentence a little bit further. All right, I'll see you in a bit, gang. Bye.